Good evening, this lecture with Zrat Hashem will be Lerfua Daniel Aaron Ben Rut, which is in critical condition, and also Lerfua Dvora Elisheva Bat Sara, and Leilui Nishmat Ferenc Bat Miriam, and Chaim Ben Meir, and also, Bezrat Hashem, uh, the successful Shidduch of uh, Lerfua Shlema of Liora Bat Barno. And the Lord is the Lord Ben Meir and the Lord is the Rafael Itamar Tzvi Ben Dvora Esther. Yesterday I started with Zrat Hashem a new series, Derech Hashem of the Ramchal. The way of God by Luzzato lived close to 300 years ago in Padova in Italy. It's very deep. Every lecture there you may need to hear more than once, definitely not on fast speed. But if you, Bezrat Hashem, will, you'll learn that series very, very good. It will help you very much in your life. Just like the other series we made, uh, all of them were very good. They changed the life of so many tens of thousands of people. This one, Bezrat Hashem, will be as good. Not thanks to me, thanks to the author, the legendary Ramchal. Ezrat Hashem will give me the talent to explain it in the right way because it's very complicated language. Very complicated. So, the words over there, it's ancient Hebrew. It's not the modern Hebrew. It's Lashon HaKodesh. And the language of a, such a brilliant person is very hard to understand. Brilliant people have their own language. Like the Gaon Mivilna once had a whole book. The entire book is abbreviation. There's no words. Just four letters, abbreviation. Five letters, three letters, the whole book. So instead of wasting paper on five books, five books he puts into one, as far as the size. Why? There was no paper. Like today, you go and buy $20, you buy a book. Printing wasn't what it is today. It's very expensive. They had to write it on the actual uh, cloth of mezuzot, the actual cloth. They, they were very, very expensive. You know, expensive, so they tried to save every inch of paper. It took years to understand what he really meant. People had to break their head. If you would give it to him, let's say after 20 years he wrote it, 20 years, and he would look at it and tell you right away everything. But the Talmidei Chachamim who tried to understand, they had to put a lot of sweat in to understand what he actually meant in his book. And some of this uh, abbreviation nobody saw before. Some Rashi uh, Tevot abbreviation appears in a lot of Torah books. So we're already used to it. We know what it means. But when you see someone that his entire book is abbreviation, obviously you know that's a super brain. But we don't have to go that far to Rav uh, the Gaon Mivilna, where 20 years ago Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul Satzal. <coughs> super, super, super brilliant head. Extraordinary sharp head. His eyes were always moving. You could never, saw, you could never see him sitting or relaxing or... All the time, was thinking, thinking. Sometimes he walked in the street, two blocks the shul from the house, and they found him two hours away on the other side of Jerusalem where the secular people live. Someone recognized him on Shabbat. Rabbi, what are you doing here? Where am I? <laughs> he walked two hours because he was so deep into the sugiya. He didn't pay attention that he's walking and walking and walking and walking two hours. This is the kind of, uh, of holy people we, we had to see in our own eyes. So far they're running out of this world. There's few more left, that's it. Few more, you can count probably on one end how many like this are left. And one time, my cousin, my rabbi, told me the story. He was a student, learned with him for 12 years. What a lucky guy. What a gift to see 12 years with one of the holiest people in the world with the biggest brain in the world and learn Torah with him in the highest possible level for 12 years. 
how you're not going to be a giant chacham when you have such a, uh, a rabbi. So, my cousin told me a story that I was shaking when I heard it. He said that one student came to Rabbi Ben-Zion Abba Shaul with a pile of maybe hundreds of pages that people wrote in his shiurim. You know, people write in a shiur when the rabbi speaks, they make notes. So they collected all the notes from all the students. And they came to him and they said, Rabbi, we would like to make a kuntres, like a notebook to publish from all the amazing shiurim that you gave in Porat Yosef. So he said to him, read, I don't have my, my glasses. And the guy read four words from the first page. He said, it's not mine. It's not mine. Four words. It's not mine. You got it from someone else. <laughs> How can it be? It's hard to believe. Oh, that there was a rabbit and bringing women that were, Baruch Hashem, becoming more religious, would bring, it, bring the women to him to get the bracha. He was sitting in his room, and I, usually every time she brought someone, he was giving her a bracha, and that's it. This time, he, he brought, she brought a pregnant woman. Just when she was standing by the hallway, before she even entered the room, he became petrified, you know? That's the right word, petrified? Mm-hmm. Like, panic. Out, out, out! He started to scream, out! Take her out! Take her out! And uh, the, the rabbits almost dropped dead. You know what an embarrassment? She brings a woman to get a bracha from such a pleasant person. He almost fainted. Take her out, take her out, quick, out of here. Then she came and said, what happened? She said, she has a mamzer in her stomach. Uh, the baby in her stomach is not from her husband. By looking at her, he knew already. Do you, you know that such a righteous person can lose his ulama by in a minute if he just made up a story about this woman, huh? Obviously, we won't do it. None of us. We're not tzaddikim. If we see a pregnant woman, we will make up a story about her. Get her out. She has a mamzer. You lose your ulama ba. That minute, you lost your share to the world to come. Amal din pne chavero barabim. Ain lo chelek la ulama ba. Ki ilu shofech damim. So an ordinary person like us wouldn't do it. Most secular people would not dare to do it. Forget about religious. Even most secular people would not embarrass a person like this in public. At least until 20 years ago, that was the case. So someone like that would behave like this? Obviously, it was no question that he knew about it. By looking at her, he already knew that the baby is not her, is not her husband's baby. I'm there. Scary. Now we still had people like this in the world. Tov, we read on Shabbat, Parashat Mishpatim, I didn't have time to talk about it yet. It has 53 commandments from the 613. 53. Mishpatim, every time it's a ve'ele, it's a continuation from the previous subject. If it's only say ele, it comes to cancel what was until now and start a new beginning. Ve'ele, and these are, that means continuation to what we spoke about in a previous page or two. Now, all of a sudden, the parasha begins. First of all, you know, according to the Ibn Ezra and Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal, next week it's going to be the Orzeit. Today, someone sent me a video from probably 40 years ago when he was a sandak in a Brit. Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal. Hard to believe that we had people like this in our days in the world. So, Rav Moshe Feinstein has a whole answer about it, and the Ibn Ezra also spoke about it, and other, other Mefarshim, they say that Parashat Mishpatim actually took place in Mount Sinai. That's why it took three hours to receive, to, not to receive, to, to be present in Mahamad al-Sinai, even though nothing was received 
besides the first two commandments. And even if you say that in the end they heard the entire Ten Commandments, how long does it take to read the Ten Commandments? Not even five minutes. Sfaradi, five minutes. Ashkenazi, one and a half minutes. Chassi, 20 seconds. <laughs> you know? It depends on, uh, on the style of the reading. Some read very fast. Some Sfaradim, the Baghdadim, the Yerushalmim. It'll take three hours. I used to have a friend, Alava Shalom, he passed from Corona. He was 82. He looked 20 years younger. Strong. When Corona started, you know, everyone was panicked, so they starved him probably. They say he's, he's coming out of it, and all of a sudden they say, I'm sorry, he just passed. He was a Baal Kore. He would read in a beautiful way, but nobody has patience. It'll take more than two hours, this reading. The idea people today want Baal Kore that it's perfect and fast. Express. Express. We have one like this in Yeshiva, Halabi. Unbelievable Baal Kore, never make any mistake, even though once, one time I called him in mistake. And I think corrected him, it only happened once in 10 years. Cannot catch him, make a mistake. It's a machine. One time I corrected him, and he ignored my correction and read it the same way. I corrected him again, but he insisted that when I didn't let go, he was sure that I'm wrong. He showed him, wow, for years I'm reading it like this. Nobody ever corrected him. So one time, I, I can maybe go to the Guinness Book of Rick. I finally called him once. That's how great the guy is. Never make mistakes. And he has a nice voice, and he reads fast. Meaning, maximum half an hour you finish. 20 minutes sometimes, depending on how long the parasha. The Ashkenazim, they don't have that many tamim. You know, so it's very fast. Moroccans, a different style than the Yerushalmi, or than the Syrian, different style, also faster. Also have less tamim. So, how did it take three hours? If it took maximum five minutes, it should have been. The answer is because Hashem read all the mishpatim. Moshe read all the mishpatim to them. He began to give them a taste of how important it is to know the laws of the Torah. You say that the Yad is in the, in the Seret Adibot. Yeah, inside so the Seret Adibot you can learn many, many other laws. But, you know, the Chafetz Chaim, 100 years ago, the Holy Chafetz Chaim, in his introduction to Mishnah Brura. Mishnah Brura is explanation about the Shulchan Aruch. By Rabbi Israel Meir Akohen Miradin, named Chafetz Chaim. His title, nickname, is Chafetz Chaim. So why Chafetz Chaim? Because it's written in Tehillim that someone who, who, is, who is a man that Chafetz Chaim, who is interested to gain life, someone that guard his mouth from speaking Lashon Hara. Okay? Shomer Priv Shono, Shomer Mi Tzarot Nafsho. But in Tehillim there is a Pasuk, Mi Aisha Chafetz Chaim, what? Yamim, Ken, Orech Yamim is going to have long life. Orech Yamim Lirot Tov. and how, how it continue? Netzor Lishoncha Meirah. Netzor Lishoncha, oh, so that's the Pasuk. Netzor Lishoncha Meirah, Usfatecha Midaber Mirma. Sur Meirah Vaseh Tov. Bakesh Shalom Verotfehu. Translation. Netzor Lashon Chamera, seal your tongue from speaking bad, yeah, right? And don't speak any deceiving things and all of that, right? Because thanks to that, you're going to have long life. So that's why they call him Chafetz Chaim, because he wrote a whole book about the laws of Lashon Hara and Motsi Shemra and all these things. So in his intro, but he was also a Talmid Chacham, not about Lashon Hara only, in everything in the Torah. In every subject in the Torah, he was a big chacham. And perfect in midot. Mm -hmm. Cannot get to a higher level in his personality. 
complete tzaddik. And what did he write in his introduction to the Mishnah Brura when it comes to the laws of Shabbat? This is what he writes. It cannot be in reality that a person will be saved from breaking Shabbat without learning all the laws perfectly. If a person does not learn the laws with all their details, even if he will hear a lot of Torah and ethical conversation and will learn a lot of Musar and will make him a Shomer Shabbos inspired to keep Shabbos, he will not be saved from breaking Shabbat. Why? Because if he doesn't know that what he does is breaking Shabbat, how the lectures are going to benefit him. I can take a Mechalel Shabbat, inspire him to stop and to become Shomer Shabbat. I can take a person, speak to him once, twice, three times, ten times, five hundred times, eventually he becomes Shomer Shabbat. But it doesn't mean he will know how to keep Shabbat. I can only do the beginning, like first aid. You found someone on the road, you are with the ambulance, you give him the oxygen, uh, some electric shot, you put him back to life, you bring him to the hospital and you put him in the hands of the doctors. Now the real recovery period begins. May take six months, may take a year. We only can get the person from dying on the street and bringing him into the hospital, which is the yeshiva. It's a hospital for the soul. Now we're going to have to get a serious treatment. And that treatment called learning Mara, learning Mishnah, learning Chumash, learning Halachot, learning Musar. It's a lot of learning. Hafez Chaim say, even if you desire very much to be righteous and to be Shomer Shabbat without learning thousands of laws, that which will take you years, you will never be a perfect Shomer Shabbos. But not only Shabbos, in every subject in the Torah. Let me give you an example. person walks in the street. Someone dug a hole, pit in the ground, in the middle of the road. Person walked, he was busy with texting. You know how people are all day like this, like mouse, all day. So he doesn't look, and there was a big hole in the middle of the road, negligent. Someone left a hole there, didn't cover it. The person tripped and fell, and his suit got ripped and stained to the point that there's no way to save it. We need to buy another suit, 300 bucks. So he began to scream, who did it, who did it? This guy, who is he, Itzik? Itzik Amir, Maze, you don't know, Baba Kama, Arba Avot Nezikim, different form of damages. What is this, negligence? Relax, relax, sir. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You have to pay me $300, look what happened to my suit. No problem, relax, let me sell you the money, calm down. Sends him the money, okay, at least you're not a thief. Negligence, he put a trap in front of a blind man, <laughs> but at least you paid. One day he dies, the owner of the suit, he come to Shamaim and Hashem say to him, shame on you, you thief. I'm a thief? Why am I a thief? I never stole a penny. You know how careful I was never to touch something without permission? And never to steal from any human being? Find me one person in the world that can claim I stole from him a penny. Mr. Big Shot, my credit is 830. Better than Hussein Obama and Sleepy Joe combined. Hashem said, oh, beautiful speech. What the chacham you are. Don't you know the Torah say that the damages of the boar, of the pit, is only shor or chamor, not about a person. If a donkey or an ox tripped and had a damage, the owner of the pit has to, responsible to pay the damage. But if a person tripped in a hole, it's not the owner, the owner of the pit, it's not his fault. Especially it's the, if he's texting. It, it's the person that walks in the street and has, he doesn't use his eyes to see where he walks. What, are you blind? Okay, so someone put a trap here. But you're supposed to see where you're going. What are you counting on, a miracle? 
today, ברוך השם, you have sidewalk, you have roads, everything was smooth. In the old days it wasn't like that, there was a lot of pits. From the rain, from other reasons. People have to open their eyes. What are you busy with? So he took the money for the suit, and actually the owner of the pit, whoever made the pit, did not have to pay him by law. If they would go to bed in, they said to him, go, I'm a haritz. Shor, chamor, velo adam. Not a person. Here you go. This is one example of many, many things that we sometimes steal without being aware we stole. Without being aware, someone asked me a question. Let's see what's your verdict. Some companies sell very expensive coats. Very expensive coat. Let's say $1,000 coat. And in China, those coats are made in China in some factory. But this factory, after they make the fancy brand name coat, right? And they sell, I don't know, 20,000, 50,000 to the, to the broker, distributor, that will sell it in all the department store in America. What do you think, the Chinese, you can trust them? They will make another 100,000 fake one without telling the one that made the order. Right? So let's just give an example. Let's say Armani order from China 100,000 suits in this cut. And they made it. After he got his container, the Chinese Bruce over there made another 300,000 Armani suits, just like he made for Armani, with the same name, the same material, the same, the same 100% the same, and sold it to someone else under the table. Why should he only sell on Armani? He will buy sell it to Ahmed, and Mustafa from Istanbul, and Itzik from Tel Aviv, and all the other crooks. Now the question is, the Armani fake suit in Istanbul, you buy it for 100 bucks, worst case scenario, 100 bucks. Here in Manhattan, $2,000. Same exact material, same exact manufacturing. How's it fake then? Wait, now you bought a suit from Manhattan for $2,000, and then you went to Istanbul and saw the same exact one for 100 bucks. And you bought one in Istanbul and came back to New York, and you said to them, I'm not happy from the suit, there is a return policy, I want to send it back. Money back guarantee. But you don't send them the one you bought in New York, you send them the one you bought in Istanbul. Mm. <laughs> same brand name, same everything. What are they going to do, let's say Macy's? They're going to take it, repack it, and sell it again to someone else for $2,000. Question is, is this a scam or no? Yeah. You took one thing and you gave the same exact thing, just came from a different store. But the same exact thing. Here, this is a bottle of water. I buy it in a gas station for $2. I go to Costco, buy it for 20 cents, right, in a case. Now I take the, after I drank the one from the gas station for two dollars, I saw it in Costco five minutes later for 25 cents. I got angry, right? So I buy it for 25 cents and I come back to the store. I'm sorry, I don't want your water. Take it. I gave him exactly, see, same exact thing. What is it? Poland Spring. Is this a scam or no? What will he do with the 25 cents? Sell it for two dollars. Was I mean, I'm entitled to send him, a, to return back the sealed water that I got from him? He gave me a sealed bottle. I came back 20 minutes later and gave it to him, said, give me back the $2, and that's the policy of the store. Money back guarantee. So if you give a fake one that is not the same quality, there's no question here that is a scam. The question is, if you give the same exact item back, which they will resell it, that means the store did not lose a penny. Is that a scam or not? Ah, that's a very hard question. What would you think? Ah, doctor, are you with us? You heard the question or no? It's the same quality, huh? it's not. I'm saying to you, 
100% same quality, same brand, same everything from the same Bruce Lee from China. But one you bought for 100, one you bought for 2,000, you give them the one you bought for 100. They, by the way, didn't pay 100. They paid a lot more because they are in New York. Bruce Lee told them 500 to our money. Because you know, in New York, people have money. So he buy it for 500 in China and sell it here for 2,000. But when Mustafa from Istanbul want to buy it, they know they had a big earthquake right now. And nobody can afford $2,000 suit and barely even a $100 suit, especially when the Turkish lira crashed already 60% before the earthquake. The money has no value there. It's very interesting. I went the other day on Sunday when I came back from Miami. I stopped by the grocery store on Main Street in Queens. So we needed to buy a few things for the house. And I saw this Turkish pistachio, the best in the world. Turkish and Persian pistachios are the best in the world. But the Turkish one, in my opinion, is they are really the best. Maybe five years ago, when I used to go to that store, it used to be $12, $13 a box. Now $8 a box. How can it be? Everything goes up. How this has went down 30% or 40%? The answer is it comes from Turkey. And the Turkish currency went down by 60%. That means that $12 minus 60% should be $5 and change. That means that the owner of the store now that sell it for $8 make more money than when he was selling it for 12 and a half. Right now he makes more money because he buys it for 60% less with his dollars. The dollar has 60% more buying power. That's why all the Israelis go to do all their necessary treatment in Istanbul. Hair transplant, teeth, whitening the teeth, teeth implants, all kinds of surgery, cosmetic surgery, I don't know, whatever they do. Good quality? First of all, the people that went there that I spoke to, they say that they are extremely nice and kind. They give you great service. There's a limo, pick you up from the airport, take you to the hotel. Everything is organized. And you can fill up your shiny, bald head in two days maximum for maximum $2,500, include all the limos and the hotel. Two coats. And you have a full hair within a year. It's a hard to resist. You could have bought a money suit for hundred dollars. <laughs> what do you think the Israelis do? They go for one day to Turkey, buy tons of clothes that are usually much more expensive in Israel for a quarter of a price for the entire year, for them, for their children, for the grandma. When Itzi go to Istanbul, he fall in love with his mother-in-law. <laughs> When he's in Israel, he doesn't like her so much. Why? He will have to spend a thousand shekel on a coat he, she wants. When he goes to Istanbul, it's 200 shekel. Grandma, look what I got for you. Wow, what a son-in-law you are. <laughs> it was 80% cheaper. So a lot of people go there. They get things so very cheap. It's unbelievable. Big saving. There's only one problem. There's only one problem. When you go to do an operation that needs anesthesia, there is a chance. I don't know how high is that chance, but it happened already, that they will steal your kidney. Yes, kidney worth 150,000 minimum today in the black market. Person has two kidneys, can survive with one for the time being. Once they put you under anesthesia in a room, you don't know what they did to you. How would you know? They're supposed to take care of one issue. They open your stomach, and they stole a kidney, put it in a box refrigerator, someplace. Once you go, then the next few hours, they sell it to someone who sells organs. Everybody cuts a very nice piece. The doctor that stole it probably gets 30, 40,000. The broker gets person, and you know, it goes from few hands. And that's a market in China, they don't need to scam you. 
If you go to jail, they do it to you without your consent. Come here, you dog. Sit here. Give him a shot. Well, well, we need some parts for people deserve living. You don't deserve to live. Open him up. Take a kidney, take this, take the gold bladder, take that, take half of his liver. They can cut half of the liver of a person and save another person with that. So in China they do it, no, there's no human rights. The government is dictatorship and they decide what to do. That's what's now going on in Israel, this big, big mess now. Yesterday they passed finally the first step of the law to eliminate the Supreme Court. Remember how many years I screamed that the biggest enemy of the Jewish nation Sorry. in the history of the world. No exaggeration. I did not lose my mind. I'm one million percent sure about what my words. The biggest enemy of the Jewish nation and Judaism is the Israeli Supreme Court in the last 30 years. Since Aaron Barak Shem Reshaim Irkav took over and decide to become the leader of Israel without anyone nominating him. Imagine a judge in the Supreme Court of the United States decide to eliminate the president, the Congress, the Senate. From now on, every law you make, we will have to approve or disapprove. Who are you? I'm a judge in the Supreme Court. Everything will be reviewed. And nobody made a beep. Why? Lefties sitting in the government, it was good for them. The Supreme Court backing us up, they're all lefties. So good, we are on the same side. So every time someone from the right make a law, immediately they run to the Supreme Court, hey, Aaron, Arale, what's up? Hey, the religious people wants us not to bring chametz into the hospital, do something. It's illegal to force people what to eat and what not to eat. I cancel the law. Uh, we want to make a wall between us and the Palestinian murderers because they're killing us every day or every other day. It's impossible, so we want to make a wall. No, you cannot make a wall. We, did, we don't agree. Uh, Israeli soldiers going now into Gaza to find a mass murderer who already killed more than 100 citizens. He's inside the building, but they are afraid that the building is booby trap. and will explode and kill 15 Israeli generals and soldiers to find that monster lowlife. So what do they do? They take one person from his group, another terrorist, they put him in front as a bait. You walk first. Nice. You walk. If they put us a trap to kill us, they'll kill their brother first. Immediately the Israeli Supreme Court, ah, how can you hurt Ahmed's feeling and health? But 15 Israeli soldiers who are trying to save us from death is gonna die for this mass murderer. It's against the law. We cancel link this. You're not allowed to do it. Everything they did is against Israel, against the Torah, against Hashem. Hundreds of hundreds of despicable decisions. Now one of them is kosher in the eyes of Hashem. Now one. You can never find one law that they pass that is decent. Such monsters, such wicked people, such corrupted people. Unbelievable. Now the law finally passed, but it needs two more approvals. It's not that easy. It passed in the first shot. It's going to have to be again next week, and again, after three times, it becomes an official law. Hazaka, three times. Do you know what's going to change? Two things are going to change. One, until now, all the judges in the Supreme Court, with no exception to the rule, were extremely liberal, lefty traders. Extremely, not regular lefty. Bernie Sanders and Wars, all of them. So now, if you have all judges are liberal lefty who hates religion and hate the right, and love gay rights, and love Hamas rights, and love everything that Hashem hates, automatically they always defeat the religion and the decent people, always. 
So what do they do? They do not let any judge penetrate the mafia before the dictator Aaron Barak approves him. Is he one of us or not? They asked him now in the interview, all these 30 years, you could not find one kosher Moroccan judge? You know what the answer? I really tried, but I couldn't find. Like Moroccans are, you know, maybe they came from the jungle, maybe they were throwing coconut at each other, eating bananas and, and peanuts. Oh, we were looking for one which we search all over on the trees, in the jungles of Costa Rica, maybe in Morocco, in the desert, between the camels. Hey, Mr. Ochayon, oh, oh, you want to be a jar? Oh my God, I'm sorry, you're not qualified. 30 years. It's tens of thousands of brilliant Moroccans, lawyers, bright people, unlimited amount of brilliant people in the justice system. 30 years, he could not find one Moroccan judge. Can you believe this fool? And then they asked him, excuse me, uh, Israel is supposed to be democratic Jewish state. That's what the Declaration of Independence say. Jewish democratic state. Not a state of international nations from all over the world that come take over. This is a home for the Jewish people after all the struggle they went through in the last 2,000 years. We finally came to revive the land of our fathers. So which one of the two you are more, he asked him, the guy. Also secular reporter, he's interviewing the, maf the head of the mafia, Barak. He asked him, which one of the two you are more, Jewish or democratic? He said, democratic. He said, but there is another condition. It has to be also Jewish. So I have no knowledge in Judaism, unfortunately. I can feel sorry for that, but my knowledge in Judaism is very, very limited. He asked him, don't you feel bad that you don't know Talmud? You don't know Halacha, Jewish Rambam, this, Shulchan Aruch. He said, I can feel bad, but I admit that I have zero knowledge. Then he asked him, do you believe in God? No. Without even finishing the sentence, this Rasha Merusha said, no. The only thing I don't understand, a week earlier, some Chabadnik put filin on him and took a video. He agreed to put filin. Maybe you should make up your mind. You believe in God or you don't believe in God. Right? If I go to Africa and the Africans bow down to some God that they made and they tell me take this string and put it around you as act of worship to our statue. Will I put it on? Don't waste my time. I don't believe in your stupid idol. It looks ridiculous, especially when I want to make a video out of me. <laughs> the video in my face. I came to bow down to their idol. Ridiculous. Why did he say right away, no? I have to understand what's happening here. When a person, when you ask a person, do you believe in God? And he say no, there could be only two options here. One is that he's a big liar. He does believe, but he say no. And two, that is a complete idiot that needs to be hospitalized in a mental institution. Immediately, he's a danger to society. Because if a person say that this little tiny Bluetooth was made by an explosion and all the wires and the connectors inside came into place by itself, Everybody would understand that someone like that is not normal. He has to be hospitalized. It's very serious danger to humanity. How can you let someone like that decide laws? How can you let someone like that be the head of the court of the country for 30 years? Teach lawyers in Harvard. How can you take such a person that believed that the world was made by itself? Do you know a normal person that ever claimed that something was made by itself? 
A bottle of water was made by, it, by itself. A book was made by itself. A table was made by itself. This one cent cup, look how many lines. All parallel equally. And made by itself. You have to be a, to a complete moron to even say something like this out of your mouth. You make a joke out of yourself. So, either you are the biggest liar and you don't deserve to be a judge. Or you the biggest fool on earth and you don't deserve to be a judge. Any judge, even in kindergarten, between the kids, you cannot be. Not to talk about the head of the court. So why is he lying? Does he believe in God? Absolutely, I cannot believe that he's so stupid. I give him a little credit. It cannot be that he's that stupid. Many people believe in God, but they claim they don't. Why? Doesn't fit their agenda. I tell you why. One time a person told me, Rabbi, I came to speak in their uh, institution. He say, I, I am a supporter of Trump, but don't say it loud. There's few guys over here. So what are you afraid of? <laughs> if they'll find out, we finish here. So lefty liberals controlling the place. If you will say, I'm a supporter of Trump, I voted Trump, your career is finished. They'll do everything they can to bury you. Same thing among the lefties. If finally one of them wants to say, I believe in God, there has to be a creator to the world. <laughs> what do you expect? That the world was made by itself? That could be the end of his career right there. Once he said the word, I believe in God, they target him as a traitor. Mafia. That's how they are, this mafia, this wicked mafia. And they are dying now in front of our eyes and they are going crazy. Every day, 100,000 people on the streets breaking, shouting, screaming, coming to the Knesset, pushing tables, fighting with the police. I said that last week, the Satan is about to lose at least half of his control over the Holy Land. Do you know what it is? Satan did whatever he wanted in the last 30 years. Destroyed the Torah, destroyed the yeshivot, destroyed the religious people, destroyed Jewish laws, promote abortions, help Hamas terrorists to kill us instigating between us and friends from different countries, even some Europeans or other countries who wants to actually support Israel and be in connection with Israel, those lefty traders run quickly. How can you support Israel? It's an apartheid. Look what they do to Palestinians. They, they betray us. Look at Bernie Sanders. Just saw yesterday an interview in Machshimo. Million times in Machshimo. Million times. It's not right what Israel does to the Palestinian. I would cancel the aid that the United States give it to them. He's Mamash a hater of Israel. Mamash like a Nazi. Bernie Sanders, Erev Rav. You looking at one or two or five here that you see every day on TV? Israel is full of hundreds of thousands of Bernie Sanders. That born in Israel. Bernie Sanders is a traitor, a self-hated Jew. He was not born in Israel and did not have any Torah education. And he can care less if all Israel, include the people, will go on fire, he will be actually happy. If Hamas will kill us all, he will make a party. No question about that. But what do you want from him? He doesn't recognize his Judaism. He's a trader, he's a liberal, he's a communist. He hates religion. And he hates Jews. He's an anti-Semite Jew. There's millions like them in the world. But someone that was born in Israel, if Israel go down, he goes down with it. Do, do they know it. You would think that someone like that at least would put some boundaries between his lefty agenda to what he's promoting. There's no boundaries, no limit. No limit. They beg the European, choke Israel, put Israel on a ban, vote in the United Nations against Israel. You know, I'll give you an example. Now, Mexico, 
מקסיקו, מחיקו. מקסיקו is a pro-Israel state or another anti-Semite state? אה? Huh? 100% anti-Semite. They always vote against Israel and always for the Hamas. Always for the Palestinian. Just like Ukraine and many other countries. So I want to ask you now. The head of the Mexican FBI ran out of Mexico to Israel. They want to catch him and kill him. Or put him in prison for life. They claim that he's responsible for the disappearance of 45 people, that he did all kinds of illegal things, as one of the most powerful people in Mexico. They want to basically destroy him. And just when Israel was about to turn him into the hand of the Mexican authorities, they vote against Israel in the United Nations. Now Israelis, if they are righties, they have pride. Oh yeah? You're going to vote against us? To, uh, you're promoting these murderers, terrorists that kill our children? And you want us to help you to turn this Mexican into your hand? What did Israeli do? What they know how to do the best? To drive you crazy with paperwork. Just like they do to all the religious people who want to make Aliyah. They drag him for six years. And nobody can make Aliyah if he has a yarmulke. Give us this, give us that, go there, go to the interview, send pictures, send birth, uh, birth certificates, send your uncle a marriage certificate. Give us this, give us that, we want the original, go to Manhattan, get an apostle, drive you crazy until you want to die. Forget about Aliyah, you don't want to leave. They make sure to take your brain and your heart out and smash them together. <laughs> I don't want to do Aliyah anymore, I don't want to say... Send me what they did to you. I have no connection. No, no, I don't want to hear about it. They make you paranoid. So now they do the same thing to the Mexican. You didn't give us this paper. Send us. You messed up. How are we supposed to understand Spanish? Ah, no one in Israel knows Spanish. We had difficulty translating this legal language. Please send us the paper that they are already translated to English. They keep stretching it. And this supposedly murderer, I don't know really what he did. If they want him so bad, that means he's probably a big fish. Walks in Tel Aviv, drinking Lechaim, cerveza with his friends. Como esta, señores? Lechaim! Soon you're going to hear he wants to convert and join the yeshiva again. So what does Israel do? Revenge. You're going to automatically vote against Israel all the time. We'll take your heart out with paperwork. That's, that's politics. Everybody does that to everyone, you know, countries. <coughs> you do this and we'll do that. If you do that, we will retaliate with this. And this amigo, muchacho, <laughs> got lucky. He's free for three years. Enjoying the beach of Tel Aviv, probably took a lot of money, millions of dollars. He lived in a very high lifestyle in Israel, and Israel is a very expensive country. More expensive than New York to live there, especially in Tel Aviv. An apartment by the beach in Tel Aviv is $15 million. It's not a joke. Very expensive. He lived a life, and the Mexicans are going crazy. Why? Go with the Hamas, that's what you're gonna get. That's a very small revenge. I mean, compare this to this. Uh, but the point is that this is what the dirty politics have every minute around, every minute. So now they're going crazy. Why? The Satan bring pe thousands of people every day. They make strikes, they don't come to work. They wanted to add trains. 100,000 people wants to come to Jerusalem. We need more trains. The woman who was in charge of it, Moroccan, on my dead body, I'll give you more trains. Walk. <laughs> I will help you to demonstrate against us. It's become so dirty. <laughs> it's a dirty battle. 
But that's what the Pirkei Avot say. Im naval, tit naval. You know what naval means? A villain. You know what a villain is? A real low life, arrogant low life. That's a villain. Where, with a villain, be a bigger villain with, with him. Don't try to be the Lubavitch Rebbe. I'll give you a bracha, you villain, that maybe you'll do tshuva. Do me a favor. He's a villain in Lavan. What Yaakov said to Rachel? Father is a big crook. But don't worry, I'm going to teach him what does it mean to be a crook. And Yaakov is the symbol of the truth. Yaakov. Titan Emet Yaakov. Yaakov's glory was his honesty. But when you deal with such a crook, such a thief, such a deceiver, such a manipulator, you're not going to be able to be righteous with him because he's going to bury you. You're going to need Hashem to interfere and maybe you're not going to get the miracle. So what do you have to do? Do the same thing the villain is about to do to you. Make sure you do it to him one hour earlier. Abba <laughs> lorgecha. <laughs> Hashkem Lorgo. So, you know, I give you an example. Let's say a person you order uh, merchandise and they deliver the merchandise, you have to give them a check. And you look, you check the merchandise, it's all fake. See right away, it's fake. So you give him a check, you know, these ink that evaporate after two minutes, you write it, and you give it to him. By the time he gets to the office, it's a blank check. Hey, what a, they're, not, they're not allowed to leave the premises without the check. But once they left, I'm sorry. You owe us the money. Prove it. Why you gave us such a check? You're a crook? No, I'm not a crook. You are the crook. And I let you, eat, let you eat from your own food. This is what you prepare for me. You know what happened with Lavan and Betuel, right? Eliezer came, they put poison in his food. Huh? The angel came and switched it. And who died? Betuel. So technically, they killed themselves. Lavan and Betuel wanted to poison Eliezer. Why? To steal everything. Why not? They killed people for much less than that. But the Malach came and switched it. You know, many times when people drink today, beer or drink, they say Lechaim, right? What do they do? Salud! Om! They hit the glasses together. Where this came from? In the old days, it was very common to poison each other. You want to kill someone, you invite him to drink beer together from the barrel. They fill up big one liter glasses. Lechaim. Before the Lechaim, everyone would drink. When he doesn't pay attention, you put some powder inside, <laughs> he drinks. It gadal with kadash. And the cerveza with it. And what happened? What did they do to prove that I'm not poisoning you? We bank the two metal glasses into each other and the drink mix. <laughs> Got it? It's a way to mix it. Boom! Collides together. Some drinks goes from here, some goes from there. And now you can drink. That's a way to prove that I'm not here to poison you. That's how it started. Today, everywhere you go, every five minutes, Rabbi, l'chaim, l'chaim, l'chaim. You want to eat something? You're about to put the meatball in your mouth? One Bukhari will get up. Rabbi, l'chaim. I cannot insult him. So, Baruch Hashem, the meatball goes down to the plate. You, you pretend you drink, because it's not going together. I want to eat the meatball with the rice. What's now drinking whiskey in the middle? Whiskey, it's either before or after. It's a little bit difficult. No limit. Lechaim, okay. Lechaim, lechaim. Oh, Asher lechaim. In the end, you only drink, you don't eat. Why? You have to satisfy everyone. Top. Anyway, Rabotai, 
So a person came, his suit got dirty, he got ripped, he, he makes the owner of the pit to pay him the money, and in the end he's a thief. Why? Because you know, he doesn't learn halachot. That's what it means, Ele HaMishpatim, Ve'ele HaMishpatim. Rabbi Avraham Grodzinski, in his book, Torat Avraham, he says, in the past, there were prophets in a Jewish nation. When a person wanted to know what he has to fix in his life, he would come to a holy man, the man of God, the prophet, and ask him what to say, what to do. Prophet would tell him, you have to do this, you have to do that. Okay, he had who to ask, he had leaders. Today, we don't have any more prophets for 2,000 years, with the exception of one fake one. Who is he? Muhammad. A prophet that doesn't know how to read and how to, how to write. No. Some people believe it's possible. 1.8 billion believe it's possible to be a prophet without knowing how to write and how to read. Make sense to you? A man of God doesn't know how to read. If you go in Israel and you find a kid that doesn't know how to read, you cannot believe it's possible. Ma? You're 20 years old and you don't know how to read? I'm dyslectic, Rabbi. Even dyslectic, they know how to read. They just get mixed a little bit. But they can understand something. An alphabet doesn't know anything. And somehow he got over a billion followers. It's a little bit hard to digest what's going on here. It's reality. Let's not get into it. So, you know, the, when once we don't, we don't have prophecies for 2,000 years, the last prophet was whom? Malachi. Malachi. In English. Aval in Hebrew is Malachi. What's Malachi? My angel. That's what it means, the name. He was the last prophet. From then on, there's no prophecy. So what do we do? We get, instead of the prophets, what do we get? Suffering. Yisurim. Yisurim are so precious. If you only knew, you would be thanking Hashem from morning to night for the suffering He sends you. If you're clever to understand why you're being punished and why you're getting this suffering. Every time you're about to do something bad, Hashem signaled to you in a different punch. One from the left, one from the right, one from this guy, one from that guy, one from the authority, one from the neighbor, one from, you know, it could be your own son even. Non-stop. Some people ignore the signals. Ignore. Once a person received the Isurim, first thing he has to check is what? How do you know what's the purpose of the suffering? How do you know? You're not a prophet. You have a headache now. Am I supposed to know where I'm getting it from? For my teeth begins to hurt. What is it for? My legs, my knee, my ankle, my stomach, my back. My ears. How am I supposed to know what I'm being punished for? For what? What's the purpose of the suffering in the nose, in the ear, in the mouth, in the head? What is the purpose? What does the Torah say? You want to learn? Or you want to make up your own rules? What do you want to do? So the Torah say, first thing you check is what organ in your body got hurt. That's the answer to your question. Your mouth got hurt, check what you put inside your mouth and what comes out of your mouth. You cursing, every other word is this and that, the cursing of the Americans, every sentence they add an extra letter over there. You speak Lashon Hara, you destroy people's life, you report all kinds of bad things about people which you make up. You angry, you yell, you scream, you put people down, you torturing your wife and your children. You know how many crimes a person can commit with his mouth? Destroy the whole world. 
Look at Hitler, יימח שמו. Few strong speeches he gave, made tens of millions of German mass murderers. How the intellectual Germans of the University of Berlin, or oh, if they see you killing a mouse, they will go crazy. If they see you kill a dog, do you know what would happen to you in Berlin? How all of a sudden they supported strongly killing Jewish babies and burning them in the oven. <coughs> Propaganda. Screaming, charismatic, yelling, blaming, manipulating, spreading lies. And unfortunately some of the things he said was also correct. Not everything was lies. The truth together with the lies and the manipulation and the charisma did the job. Of course, it's all Hashem. It's all HaKadosh Baruch Hu behind everything. But from the natural point of view, charismatic leader can turn 100 million people into monsters in, in less than a month. So, first thing you do, you check what organs got hurt. Your ears. Problem with your ears, lots of infection. You're listening to gossip. You're hearing goish songs. You're listening to dirty language. Something you are doing wrong with your ears. Hashem did not press the button call ear by random, random choice. No. It was directed to your ear. It was directed to your nose, it was directed to your mouth, it was directed to your throat, it was directed to your brain, it was directed to your knees, to your back, to your stomach. Everything has a purpose behind it. Stomach, check what you eat. Check what goes in. Who knows how many worms you eat every day in your greens that you don't clean. Counting on a mashgiach that can barely open his eyes after 10 hours sheep to clean the parsley for you. Oh, what a naive guy you are. Hey, Mendel, who's Marste? How is the parsley and the cilantro? Very good. You check them with the light, everything, you, with the soap, you put them in the soap for 20 minutes, <laughs> make sure all the worms would slide, you rinse them well, you check in the light, one by one, of course, 20 years, that's all I do. Now you don't see, I'm not married, I don't have children. I, all day I check leathers and parsley. I'm an expert. <laughs> you really believe that nonsense? Huh? Uh, you know, when a kosher wife, if she buys a parsley or cilantro, it will take her half an hour to clean it for one salad of the family. Huh? Half an hour to clean. So, the solution to spoiled American wife is to buy Gush Katif before it was given to the Hamas. They were growing parsley and cilantro and lettuce on water without ground. In water. There's a way apparently to do it. So like this, there's no worms. Worms come from the ground. And then they rinse it well, they pack it. Sometimes you have bugs, flies that penetrate in. So you still have to separate them and rinse. Okay, but at least you know that you're not supposed to have tiny worms in it. But the only problem is that a little box like this which two people eat in one meal, and that's it, six, seven dollars. Not much, few leaves. It's, it's more expensive than silver. You buy Hanukkah menorah, it's cheaper than to buy enough green for the Lela Seder. <laughs> the letters that you have to give to everyone, two, three kazait, you know, you need a mortgage for that. For the matzot, oh, you need a third year's mortgage. For the letters, 15 years mortgage. No. So the point is, what is the happiest moment of the wife when you take her to Israel <laughs> and you walk in Shuk Machne Yehuda doing shopping for Shabbat and she finds out that the parsley and the letters, the Gush Katif, the Czech one cost 
10% of the price over here. Wow! Instead of seven dollars, it's not even a dollar. What happened to you? Want to catch up for all the money that got burned in New York? <laughs> like 20 of them. So all week you eat parsley, <laughs> cilantro. Why? Oh, finally normal price. We kill you over here. By the time it gets here, they need to bring it with the with the plane with cooling system. It's expensive. So you have stomach problems. If you could only see how many millions of worms went through your stomach because you're not careful about what you eat. <laughs> He would say, Hashem, thank you, it's only these stomach problems. I, oh, I admire you for being so considerate. Bottom line, you get the point, no? You have heart problems. Why you have heart problems? All day you eat like a pig. This steak, this burger, this one, this one. Cholesterol, cholesterol, cholesterol. You can't control your appetite. You can't control your desires. 20 years later, you get a heart attack. Why did Hashem make people gain weight so fast? Just when they eat 20% more than what they should, two months later, they become a boat. How is it? I don't know how I gain so much weight in three months. What am I eating? An extra cheesecake, that's it. That's right there, half a pound a day. Why did Hashem do it? It's really not fair. Putting such delicious food on the table and you expect us not to taste from each one? Ah, that's a test in life. Let's see how you, how you can control your desire. <sighs> to touch, not to touch. Do I need the extra 500 calories on this dessert? Do I need it? Do I don't need it? Do I need this cork? But, nah, chaval, 300. You calculate. You're dying to eat? The burning from inside and you don't touch. Sure. That could be a sacrifice, like bringing a sacrifice to Bet HaMikdash, the Ben Ishchai say. Ben Ishchai say. If you have something like watermelon, Ben Ishchai, from his language I understood that he liked very much watermelon. Like me, I also love it very much. I'm like him, I mean. <laughs> so... He said that when you see that big cold watermelon in a humid summer in Baghdad, 95 degrees, 90% humidity, no air condition, 100 years ago in Baghdad, you know how your neck become crazy glue with lines? You know those black lines? And you're, you're feeling your tickle in your back. A line of sweat and another line. Mamash me'arata netifim. And you see this cold watermelon. And you say, Hashem, lichvotcha, I don't touch it. Counts like you bought a sacrifice to Bet HaMikdash. What an exaggeration. Not at all. 999 people out of a thousand will not be able to pull their hand from that watermelon if they really love it in a hot, humid summer day. That's the dessert right now. In Baghdad or in Poland, same story. But the one that will die to attack that watermelon from all directions and his stomach is shrinking and flipping over and waves goes into his brain and the saliva begins to drip. You see his face is almost crying. Moshe, eat some watermelon. Don't worry, it's... I just got it, it's fresh. Oh no, I can't, I'm stuffed. Eat, enjoy, Shabbos, Yom Tov. And he said, for you Hashem, I don't touch it. Try it, try it at home. You know how they say, don't try it at home? I say, try it at home. <laughs> Try it at home. Let's see if you're able not to touch. Yeah, try it. See how difficult it is. Then you know how far you are from Hashem. In my series that I started yesterday, Way of Hashem, it will become very clear to you why there are certain things we do and we can control. So we continue, Rabotai. 
Back then we had like a radar. We had the prophets and they told us what to do. Now what's the radar? Is the suffering and the pain. And Hashem is sending the pain measure for measure. If your legs hurt, you committed sins with your legs. What kind of sins you can commit with your legs? Watch where you're walking to. Your legs is the base of your body. They take you to bad places. Ah, you use the legs I gave you to go to the stadium to burn four hours on Shabbat instead of being in shul or in yeshiva and enjoy the Shabbos meal. You went to the game or to the beach with naked people over there. 20 years you're repeating it. Oh, then you wonder why you cannot walk. You have to sit on a wheelchair or something happened or horrible surgery in your legs or an accident. Or who knows? Why? Ah, it's so barbaric. It's so fanatic. It's so annoying. Who made you a speaker of God? How many times I heard that over the years? Dozens of times. Maybe more than a hundred times at least. Over the years, people send email, angry email. You see that they're fuming when they write the email because you see a lot of typos. <laughs> That's how you know a person is fuming. <laughs> he can't really even check himself because he's so angry to tell you how much he hates you. Also, so, also caps. <laughs> so, usually the response is always the same. The same wicked people always respond the same. Always. It's mamash like a phenomena that repeats itself all the time. By all kinds of wicked. Israeli, American, Russian, doesn't matter. They get very angry when they hear a speaker say in the name of the Torah, that part in the name of the Torah somehow they delete from their mind when they respond. It's good for their agenda to blame you, because it's not comfortable to come and say, I don't accept Hashem's ruling. Who is he to send me a punishment to my head just because my head thinking negative things? I mean, dirty things. For that, I have to get cancer in my brain? Shame on you for saying it. Because there was intermarriage 80% in Germany, that's why there was Holocaust in Europe. How do you dare to say, oh, how do you know? You're the speaker of God? No. So how do you know? I don't know. We don't know. Maybe it's a different reason. You're right. It could be many, 5,000 reasons. But if it happened, it's heresy to say we didn't deserve it. When a person die, nice one. We all love him. Wow. Such an angel. And he died in a horrible accident near on Ocean Parkway. A minute after Yom Kippur. Baal Tshuva. It happens here a few years ago. Car dealer, became religious, came out of the shul, and I think it was in Bnei Yosef. Car came in full speed. Five minutes after Yom Kippur end. Boom! Hit him and killed him on the spot. Some people dare to say, it's not fair how he died. He didn't deserve it. To say something like this, you have to be extremely, extremely stupid and arrogant and has chutzpah and 100% infidel. Because you move with your emotions. Emotions, like a child. Act from his emotions. What does it mean he didn't deserve it? You mean that Hashem is a criminal? That's really what you say. To say that someone that got cancer didn't deserve it, or someone that died young didn't deserve it, or the people that got earthquake didn't deserve it, or the Jews that died in the Holocaust didn't deserve it. I understand you speak from pain. We also have that pain. You're not the only Jew that care about other Jews that died. We also have feelings. We also feel horrible to see people drowning. We also feel terrible to see children in Turkey are dying and burying under the thing. But we don't have to say that Hashem doesn't know what he's doing. Why do I have to become an infidel just because Hashem decided to bring a natural disaster to the world? 
That means that because of that, I have to go and rebel against the creator of the world that he doesn't know what he's doing. You have to think a million times next time before you comment, any kind of comment, about something Hashem does. You have to be extremely careful when you praise a gay person who came out of the closet, because that alone can cause you 500 years in hell. Just this alone, and it's not an exaggeration. If you dare to type in the internet, I'm proud of you, that you love boys. Congratulations. I don't see a problem being religious and being gay at the same time. Do you know what punishment is waiting for you just for these two lines that you typed? If you knew you will kill yourself today, you wouldn't wait for your hell. Today you will kill yourself. Let's get it over with. But you're dumb. What did it help you to compliment a criminal that come out of the closet and does Chilul Hashem in front of millions of people? That the Goim think, look at these Jews, they are, they are the chosen people. Look what they do in Tel Aviv. Look how they dress. Wow, how can it be? I'm a witness. How many Goims wrote me emails that they are disgusted by the behaving on some of these Israelis, or Jews, or liberals, or, you know. Then they say, oh, why there was such a horrible Holocaust? If you are a liberal trader, what makes you think that the goyim will stand you forever, you fool? What do you think? At one point, they're going to lose their mind. Many of them are violent. They already have desire to kill. And now they have this annoying liberal Jew who is pro-abortion, who is anti-God, who makes fun of the religion. And what did you expect? That they sit home forever and eat their heart and let you continue with your liberalism? Every day you were surviving, it's a miracle. That's really the painful truth. They bring the Holocaust on us, and who they're going to blame in the end? God. And King Solomon already predicted it. It's written, Ivelet Adam tesalef darko ve'al Hashem is af libo. The foolishness, or stupidity, or a person tesalef darko will get him off the right path. It's going to the wrong direction. And he will hold Hashem accountable for what happened. Not himself. Why did I get it? Because you are wicked. That's the truth. Face it. Why did Hashem have to do it to us? Because you are wicked. Why I'm wicked? Because you're a mass murderer. I'm a murderer? I, don't, I never killed a person. You kill them on the internet with your articles every day, with your blog. Do you know how many victims already you have in your list? Do you know how many people you destroyed their life and family and marriage and children and you know how many damages you made? There is one Rasha Merusha in a comedy show in Israel made fun at Rav Zamir Cohen. Rabbi Zamir Cohen is definitely one of the top three machzirim betshuva in the whole world for already 30 years. 30 years, every night lectures, he wrote probably more than 10 books, which changed the life of many people. He's a brilliant person, and the best part about him, in my opinion, that he's a perfect Baal Midot. I made maybe 50 seminars with him over the years, all over the world, Los Angeles, here, Israel, other places. I see the person, a real gentleman. It's called Atzilut. You know Atzil? Atzil, you know what Atzil means? How do you say Atzil in, in English? <laughs> Nobleman. Nobleman, that's Atzil? Nobleman, nobleman. Never gets angry. Never say foolish things. Never lose control. Constant in Avodat Hashem. Torah ve'irat shamayim. And this comedian idiot, who barely knows how to read two words in Hebrew, make fun of him, imitates him. 
few months pass by, he has a beautiful villa in Tel Aviv, Hashem burns his house. Millions of shekel of damage, passports, pictures, wedding pictures, all the things of the family, wedding pictures of the children, all his clothes, jewelry, everything got burned to ashes. Do you think insurance will cover for such a damage? Insurance is only money. What about your wedding pictures? All of them are gone. What? <laughs> the Chilonim sometimes do look at them. Passports. Do you know what a headache? To change now, to go, to make birth certificates. You know how much headache you have if Chas Shalom the house goes on fire? You have to go buy sheets and blankets and pillows and, uh, and, and silverwares and plates and, and all the refrigerator and the dishwasher and renovate the house and to wait a year until the, in Israel can be four or five years until they rebuild the house. It's not about the money. If a person is a multimillionaire, but that's his home, he can right away put a million dollars and rebuild the house. But that's not the point. It's going to take forever. Get permits, do this, architect, meeting, submit the papers, 500 times change this, move this, lower the ceiling, do that, make a security room, make the security room in this measurement, put the filter inside, make sure it's sealed, call someone to check the pressure in the ceiling because it's against chemical war, or oh, there is a leak. You have to fix it. We're going to come back next month. You know what it means? How much headache? Especially if you're a lazy person. You lose your motivation to live. You want to now start building everything from scratch? It's a very big punishment. Very big punishment. I'm sure that this idiot is asking, why me? I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it? You don't deserve to breathe. You're making fun of one of the most important people on earth that saved tens of thousands of people and brought them back to Hashem? One of the people that probably, I don't know, I don't want to say the top 10, but I don't know, top 100 people in the world that makes Hashem the happiest? And you want to mess with the child of Hashem that he's so proud of and he loves him so much and appreciate what he does so much? And then you ask, why me? It's comedy. It's not, it's not serious. We make fun at everyone. Oh, you're going to make fun at Rav Mazuz? You make fun at Rav Ovadia? You make fun at Rav Zamir? There's going to be consequences to it. You're going to have to pay the price. You're lucky you pay the price here. You're lucky. Because that, if not here, in hell, it's 500 times worse. If you are not understanding what I say, read the introduction of the Ramban to the book of Yov, the book of Job. Do yourself a favor. Read it. It describes what's happening in hell over there. In one sentence, I can conclude it for you. If you're not going to read it, so at least you have an idea that Seven years of the suffering of Yov. All his children died, lost all his money, had diseases, all his friends turned their back on him. From the happiest person in the world, from the most successful person in the world, he became the most miserable person in the world. Until it drove him nuts. So it cannot be. Hashem had to make a mistake between Yov and Oyev. It's the same letters. Something in the spelling in the computer of Hashem went wrong. How I became the enemy of Hashem that he hates me so much? How did he kill all my children? How did he take away everything I had? What have I done wrong? I'm not committing any sins. So the Ramban say, a disastrous life like this for 70 years will not be equal to one our in hell for the wicked people. All these politicians, all these corrupted wicked people, all the Mechalele Shabbat, all the organizer of the gay parades, all the people who hide behind a fake name and write poison against righteous people in the internet. 
all these lefty liberal traders, what's waiting for these people? It's not my personal opinion. I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression here. I don't sit and wish them bad. I'm just telling you what's written. My job is to teach what's written, what's, what Torah is, what Gemara say, what the Rambam say, what the Zohar say. That's what we're talking here about. Don't go home and say, the rabbi say such and such. No. You never heard from me anything. From me, nothing. You only heard from me what others wrote in the holy books, in the name of Hashem. That's all what you hear from me. Don't sit here and express my personal opinion. Even when I speak about politics, it's nothing to do with politics. It's life and death of the Jewish nation. It's the future of the yeshivot. Is the future of the Torah, is the future of this mass murdering abortion system that kills tens of thousands of Jewish babies brutally every year in Israel. It's giving Israel to the Hamas field to take more and more and more until we won't be able to walk in the street to let the Supreme Court destroy every aspect of Judaism for 30 years and no one made a beep. They choked us from all direction. They occupied the army. They occupied the police. They occupied every courtroom in Israel. They occupied the entire media, the radio, the TV stations. Everywhere it's in their hand. It's similar to a person that has cancer spread in his body. There is not one inch in a body without the cancer. That's where Israel is right now. Well, now we started finally to clean the cancer after 30 years. Good luck with that. We really need millions of miracles from Hashem to, to be successful. Few of them happened already. The victory in the election, a minister of justice that is brave and serious and is going full force against tens of thousands of wicked who bark non-stop at him everywhere he goes. It's not easy. You need to be a super strong person, super strong person. Do you know what it is? You sit in a place and 10,000 dogs bark at you and curse you and wish you to die and blame you for revolution, you're destroying democracy, you're a dictator, you're destroying Israel. You know what they did to Israel? They come to all the financial institutions to badmouth Israel that they take out their money and investment out of the high-tech industry. Hundreds of billions of shekel. Some of them started to pull their money out. The dollar went up from 340 to 364 in a week. Maybe 7, 8 percent. That means the Israeli shekel is collapsing. What else? They go to the United Nations begging them to force Israel to stop fixing their justice system. Keep it in the hand of the lefty Supreme Court. How do you dare to make it equal? It has to be lefty. The United Nations knows that their biggest damage to Israel is the Supreme Court. The United States, Sleepy Joe and all his friends, they're going crazy. Wow, Israel is finally going to become a Jewish democratic state, but for real. Not fake like he was until now, dictatorship of the lefties. The future of the Jewish nation is on the line. People think we talk about politics. What, are you normal? Who cares about politics? This is a war of survival. If Chas Shalom, they would continue another five to ten years, there would not be Israel. We would not be able to even go visit Israel. They were going into a direction of destroying us completely, every religious person. What do you think? It's random, it's coincidence that almost no religious people can make Aliyah to Israel already for decades? They don't let anyone make Aliyah. I had a neighbor, Baruch Hashem, in the end he made Aliyah. He did make, but he is a religious man all his life. Extremely religious, orthodox Jew from birth, him and his wife. Family of religious, 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 all the way to Moshe Rabbeinu. Children that are religious, three of them I believe already live in Israel. With families. 
a man seven years old and his wife close to 70 wants to make aliyah to Israel. They submit the papers. We don't want Israeli aid. We're not asking you to give us, to pay for us. We're not little children. We want to come be with our children and our grandchildren in the Holy Land. They sold their house next to me and they don't let them make aliyah. If I'm not mistaken, for about a year. A year they stretch them with excuses. Give us this, give us that. Give. Come on. Every gay that comes in three weeks is in Israel. Every Arab who wants to make aliyah in one month is in Israel. Every Ukrainian that says, I want to get out of here in one day is in Israel. Without paperwork. Tens of thousands of them coming every year or every month. Unbelievable amount. And a religious righteous rabbi wants to come to Israel to be with his grandchildren. They don't want him. They don't want religious people because these wicked people controlling everything there. Calling themselves Jewish agency with no shame. Just zero on Judaism in him. Nothing Jewish about them. Just hate, hate to the Judaism. Hate. He sold the house and doesn't have where to live. He never believed in his worst imagination that they're going to drag him another month and another month and another month after he sold the house and he cannot come to Israel. Have to live by this kid, have to move to another kid. What do you think? It's easy in this age to live in some living room or bedroom of your, of your son? To fall on your children? You have to live by them because... You have nowhere to live because you sold your house and you were already sure that six months earlier you'd be in Israel. <laughs> what? I have proof of Judaism. We are Jews for generations. I'm not a convert that you have maybe a question. Maybe my conversion is not kosher. I am the most Jewish on earth. If I'm not a Jew, no one is a Jew. And I give him our time. You understand what it means? Liberalism, lefty, that's what they are. The most evil people on earth. I'm not an extremist. Don't think, oh, it's an extreme speech. No, no, no. It's 100% reality. I wish I had better things to say about them. If, they, if I had something good to say about them, I promise you I would. To my biggest enemy, I say when they did something good, I gave them the compliment. I'm trying to stay objective as possible. But I promise you, I cannot find one positive thing about these lefties. I can't. All they do is disaster. They murder babies. They take the, steal the money from the poor and give it from the rich and give it to the poor. They take money from Israel and give it to Arabs who declare they won't rest until they kill us all. They bring non-stop, non-Jewish immigrants to Israel to flood Israel with goyim in order for them to destroy the Jewish religion and give Israel to our enemy. They do horrible things. They want the soldiers to die because they worry about the life of some terrorists who already killed a hundred Jewish people. They worry about him. Even when the government decided to start knocking down their homes, they went crazy. How do you knock down a house of an Arab? What do you mean? He just went with his car and killed six people in a bus stop. What should we give him? Maybe a trophy? If it was up to them, they would give him a trophy. Because that wicked judge that sits in a court in his mind, the Palestinians should have killed the Jew. Because they don't believe in God, and they don't believe in the Torah. And they don't believe we have the right to sit in the Holy Land. And they hate everything Jewish. They are just like the anti-Semite in the United Nations. Now one time they voted for Israel, ever. The whole United Nations was made only for one purpose, to condemn Israel. Check the history. Every vote, Israel, Israel, Israel. No Iran, no Syria, no North Korea, nothing. No Putin even. <laughs> Barely a few words about Putin. Putin killed over, I don't know, 200,000 people or whatever. They barely speak anymore. One year a war, one year. They condemn Israel 
thousands of times more they condemn Putin. Or the Iranian Ayatollahs, who spread terrorism all over the world and kill innocent people by the minute. Or Assad, who poisoned tens of thousands of his own citizens with chemical. Nothing. Nothing in the United Nations. Or North Korea, who, you, uh, you don't want to know how they torture their own people. Or in China, you know what they do in China? Uh, two million Muslims in camp, re-educating them, torturing them, giving them electric shots, connecting things to their brain, giving them shots, make them scream, Muhammad is a dog. Now one word in the United Nations against China ever. Israel, Nazis, apartheid. Antisemitism drip from their, from every hole in their body. So, Rabotai, now we need to count on Hashem's miracle. Few of them already happened, but we need thousands of them to follow. The job only started now. Let's hope Mansovada will bring us some good news. So, Rabotai, now I want to tell you something extraordinary. Please pay attention, and maybe we'll finish after that. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends us pain to recognize why he sends us the suffering. Once the hand gets hurt, or the leg, or whatever, we, we describe it, that means that Hashem is hinting to us that this organ participate in the sins that you commit. That's why I heard those organs and not the others. I want you to think, search, investigate, and repent. Where does it say it? Nachpesa drachenu v'nachkora v'nashuva elecha. What does it mean, nachpesa? Nechapes. We will search. Drachenu. The right path. We will search for the right path. And we will investigate. V'nachkora. V'nashuva elecha. And in the end, we will always return to you, to your direction. We'll check, check all directions, all possibilities, until we find the right path to come back to you, Hashem. So the Gemara say, if a person see he gets suffering, what's the obligation to do immediately? Yefashfesh bemaasav. Yefashfesh means to search carefully. Carefully. It comes from the word pishpishim, pishpesh. You know what pishpesh? You know those little tiny lice? Lice. Or leech. Those tiny ones, but very tiny ones. That they used to, you know how they check the, the hair of the kids? Today I think they have shampoos and stuff that kills it and they have a comb. But I remember in the old days, they used to check, oh, we found one, pulling it out, click. <laughs> That's called lice, kinim. Then in the end, they wash the hair, they wash the hands. Until next week, there will be another wave of attack. Problem is that these lice go also into the wool blanket. So you have to check for them with the light and this. You need to have good eyes. That's called lefashfesh. Meaning just like you look for this pishpishim, these lies, check every action of your life if it's correct or incorrect. The Gemara say, a person see he gets suffering, lefashfesh b'maasav. You have problem with your eyes? Watch what you're looking at. If a person pishpesh velo matza, he search everywhere and he doesn't see why Hashem is giving me this suffering, right? Itle bebitul Torah. If you check tefillin, I put davening, I daven, tzedakah, I give a lot, modesty, 
מי אין מי וייפ ארמדס, מקווה טהרת משפחה פרפקט, כושר פוד, אונלי בדאץ. נו, וואט אלס? צ'קינג, צ'קינג. מי קיד? בסט ישיבות. נו, נו, וואט קן אד בי אין דאט קייס? לשון הרע? יא, פריטי גוד. נו, מה עוד? ציצית? מיאמי ביץ', 100 דגריז, 190% הומידיטי, וול ציצית! שכויח. וואט אפנאט. טוב, נו, מה עוד? מה עוד? מה עוד? לרנינג תורה? אברי די דף יומי. אין אנדר הלכה או טו. לרנינג, אין אין איבנינג, אין אנדר 15 מינטס ודי. with the cinnamon tea. What do you do, Moshe? Freezing. I learn half an alacha a day. You can't finish the whole alacha. I don't ask for too much. Better a little bit with kavana from a lot without kavana. Well, how they always find the right sentences that suits their agenda. <laughs> so, checked everything. You nice to your mother-in-law? Absolutely. To your father-in-law, ma, I kiss his hand every time I see him. I call him Abba. Wow, באמת אתה צדיק. אפילו רב קוק and רב אדס have to come get a lesson by you. You daven better than רב מרדכי שטיינר from מונסי. Believe me. I told him how to daven. טוב, נו. So, we checked everything and I'm still getting suffering. My eyes, my, my ears, my back, my legs. Oh, wow, I can't move, help me out. What happened? You're only 50, why you have a cane? Don't ask, I have a slight disc. Help me out, Rabbi, I need to replace my disc. But you're very young. Why you cannot walk? I don't know what Hashem wants. You checked everything? Yes. You tzaddik? גדול הדור I am. טוב, if you still get suffering, השם doesn't make mistakes. The judge in Manhattan can make mistakes. Friends can make mistakes. Doctors make mistakes. השם does not make mistakes. Get it to your head already. No mistakes by השם. You suffer. It's all from your avonot. But I told you, I made a whole investigation. I went one by one and I did not find any problem. Do you learn enough Torah? Maybe not. Conclusion, that's the reason. You don't learn enough Torah. This is what the Gemara say. I have an objection. To express, mechila mikvod hachachamim, something here I don't understand. When a person has a problem in his business, losses, losses, when you begin to recover the business, you start with the biggest losses to the smallest losses, or first you focus on the $5 loss, and then $10, and $15, and then in the end you get to the $10,000 loss, and $30,000 loss. How do you recover the business correctly? You start from the biggest problem and move on to the smallest one? Or you start from the smallest, and the bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and bigger, until you get to the biggest problem? What's the right way to recover a system that has a defect. You have to start right away from the most urgent loss. So when you have a list of 500 things to check, tefillin, tzitzit, kashrut, tefillot, tzedakah, lashon hara, so many things, chametz in Pesach, all the way to my machronim, and to chalav Yisrael, and to kemach yashan. There's so many things to check. After you checked all the little things and the mediocre things and the big things, you checked and everything is V, now check the biggest out of everything, which is learning Torah. Which the Gemara said, Limut Torah can negate kulam. You put learning Torah in one side of the scale, everything else in the other side, learning Torah is greater than everything else combined. 
I don't get it. That should have been the other way around. Person see that Hashem sends him suffering, he suffer. He cannot function, he cannot focus, he scream from pain. Every step he makes with, with pain. Every time he gets up from the chair, it's pain. His teeth hurts, his brain explodes. Attack, vibration, depression. So many problems, authorities, police, lawsuits, bad neighbors. His children eat his heart every day. So many suffering. After you checked everything. Okay, so I guess it's, uh, you're not learning enough Torah. Add two more hours a day. It didn't help, add three. Didn't help, add five. Until it would stop. It should have been the other way around. First check if you learn enough Torah. No, I barely learn. Oh, that's enough. You deserve every suffering you get. You're lucky you're alive. You don't do, you don't fulfill the main purpose of your life. Hashem gave you all his wisdom in one hand, serve on a gold platter, throw it to the garbage. You don't even open it. It's on a shelf accumulating dust. You don't listen. Even in a shul you come to pray, the rabbi is about to give 10 minute speech, you run quickly to the shul end. Why? How can I even waste 10 minutes on the speech? Ma, Ma where you run? There's a kiddush. Herring, good herring and whiskey. Schmaltz. Fleisch. Amazing. Rega, but the, the Chacham is giving a 20 minute speech. Every day 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. After a few years you're gonna know a lot. I'm sorry, Rabbi. I mean, come on. It was already two and a half hours davening. Now another ten minutes. I don't want to upset my wife. She's waiting alone. Who's going to do Kiddush for her? Oh, all week he mamash care about her if she's alone. Achshav pitom, I don't want to upset my wife. Where are you every night sitting with your friends playing domino and cards and go to smoke nargila in Astoria by the Greeks? Rabbi, my husband is going with his friends twice a week. Where is he going? Hookah. I learned a lot of stupid things from the stupid people who ask me questions. Maze hookah? You know, nargila. Ah, nargila. Tov. How do I know what nargila is? When I was a child, my father used to take me to the Temanim. He had one friend. His best friend was a Yemenite guy. Yefet. Sharabi, alav shalom. Die young, in his late 50s. So, his parents lived in Shkunat Atikva, which was half Yemenites, and the other half Persians and Iraqis. This was most of the people there. And there, they had a donkey connect to two round stones. That's their mixer. They picked up one stone, they put the hot peppers, dry hot peppers. Today you go to Costco, you collect it, three dollars. Curry flakes. You know this red one? Yeah, yeah cheese, like <laughs> they put on a pizza. The Temanim did it by hand. They picked up the hot pepper, made it dry, put it over there. They give the donkey one shot, you know where. <laughs> He begins to move like the guy in Home Depot. You know the guy, excuse me, can you help me? <laughs> Fifteen minutes until he comes one aisle. Why? He wants to burn time. He doesn't want to climb on a ladder, get you some brush from the top. No, he walks like this in slow motion. One time when you see he goes like this, he goes like this. What's the, what are you doing? Trying to do fast forward, two times speed. <laughs> Maybe you move faster. Anyway, so I used to go to the Temanim and I see the old man and the old woman. Like this, Nargila, and the smoke comes out of their nostrils. Like this. Perfect. Lemon tree, hot peppers, they do the schug. The woman with Teilim. Zecharia with the Nargila, 
like this, the donkey, the donkey goes around, and that's my childhood. I used to go, and next to that, there was the best falafel in the history of the world, by a Yemenite woman, Nurit. Hard to believe how this Yemenite woman was close to eight years old, standing for hours in a little boot, making maybe two, three hundred falafels, lines you cannot believe. And she stands, and more, and more, and more, and more. She was a religious woman. It was a whole different world than today. My gosh, nothing. Few would go for one day to walk around in the street, in a shuk, see the, the kind of people that you used to have. Completely different world. So Rabotai, Nargila, he's worried, his wife is alone. Every night he lives there. One night he sits with the friends in a Bukharian shish kebab house. The next day he plays soccer. Ah, we need to watch the health. The third day, he, go, he, he goes to a birthday party. Why he didn't come to the shiur? He went to a birthday party. The fourth day, he will find what to do. All of a sudden on Shabbat, 10 minutes speech. No, 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 my wife is waiting. The Kiddush. I can't torture her. She didn't make Kiddush. She needs her Nescafe, you know? So you know all this baloney. It's all excuses. In the end, a person knows full of you know what. <laughs> so the conclusion now, my question, now, now let's get serious for a minute. Why did the Gemara didn't say check if you learn enough Torah? If you learn enough Torah, check about Shabbat. If you keep Shabbat strictly, check about Tarat Mishpacha. Your wife, Mikveh, checking. If you perfect with Tarat Mishpacha, check the Kashrut. You strictly kosher. If you are perfect with the Kashrut, check how much Zdaka you give, how selfish you are. How people would save your soul, you don't even donate a penny a year. All you do is take, 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 and you don't care about anybody else. Like thousands of people who listen for 20 years and never help with a dollar. They don't care. Why don't care that other lost Jews can maybe see the truth? What should I care? I'm already saved. My children are in yeshivot. Let them drop dead. Why should I care about them? And if they didn't care about you, where would you be today? Someone else saved you. Why don't you want to save the next person? Huh? Obligation. It's an obligation, of course it's an obligation. An extreme obligation. It's a serious crime to be ungrateful. It's a serious crime not to care about your brothers that are drowning. It's a serious crime not to care about the pain of Hashem that 80% of his children are worse than goyim in their behaving. The goyim are more religious in Judaism than them. Do you know what an embarrassment it is? What a chilul Hashem? That a guy in Texas watch on the news in CNA, 100,000 gays walk in Tel Aviv naked, and they want to destroy the religion? A guy in Texas, sitting over there and he's rubbing his eyes. This is the Jewish state of the chosen people? That's what they taught me in a church all my 50 years of life. We have to love the chosen people and admire them? to promote abomination? Then he turns the other channel and see the lousy face of Bernie Sanders and Jack Schumer and all the rest of the Reshaim Arurim, one by one. What is the guy in Texas supposed to think? What is he supposed to think? Or the Arab in Saudi Arabia who watch it in Al Jazeera. Think about it. So our obligation is to try to save as many as souls as we can from the drowning ship. If we will neglect that obligation, we will, held, will be held responsible for every soul that died for eternity that we could have saved. So the ones that will pay the biggest price are the wealthy Jews who do not donate to Kiruv. They will have the biggest responsibility, Hashem is going to hold them responsible. Especially if they burn their money on nonsense. I heard about someone that Hashem gave him a unique talent. 
one out of a hundred million people have his talent. Very unique. Very, very unique. He makes fortune and lose everything in gambling. For decades already. No. No. Imagine if he would take all the millions he made and would save 100,000 lost souls instead of burning it in a casino. What will he gain as opposed to what he lost? How to believe? So many other issues like this. So the answer is, Rabotai, listen to this brilliant answer. You won't believe it. Torah, you would know. Oh, the Torah, the Chachamim say, listen, listen, don't be a fool. If you checked every aspect of your life and you did not find anything wrong with you, nothing wrong with tefillah, with Shabbat, with Tarat Mishpacha, with your Midot, with your Tzedakah, with your Davening, everything is perfect. It's because you're an ignorant fool. That's why everything looks to you fine. Someone who learns Torah, the more he learns, the more he understands how far he is from the truth. If you learn the laws of Shabbat for two, three months, from morning to evening, Sit in yeshiva 10 hours a day, Shabbat, 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 Borer, Tfira, Kotev, Tochen, all the laws of Shabbat. You already learned 3,000 halachot. You know what's allowed, what's not allowed. By learning, you discover every day that at least 50 times you break Shabbat every week. And you fix, and you fix, and you fix, and you fix. If you come and say Shabbat, perfect, of course. This is perfect, everything perfect, perfect. <laughs> Do you know why it's perfect? Because your mind is zero, blank, empty, empty page. Now one word is printed on a page. That's your brain. That's why, because you never learned Torah, you think you are righteous. I have a lot of chilonim in Israel. That's how they go. I need tzaddik. I am righteous. You're righteous? No, let's hear why. I don't steal. I don't smoke. And I don't play snooker. Billiard, whatever you call it. Ah, you don't steal. How many times you went into the pizza shop and took straws and cups and napkins because you needed it? Ah, that's not stealing. Of course it is. Imagine a person has a pizza shop, 500 people a day come, each one take a cup, few napkins and this. He's bankrupt. 500 people a day take napkins that they didn't buy anything there. Of course it's stealing. Using stamp in the place of your work without permission, it's stealing. Borrowing a car, saying I'm going 10 minutes to my mom, to pick up something and I'll be right back and stopping somewhere else. That's stealing. It's another dollar or two of gas. I can give you a list of 5,000 things a day that they steal. You know, they make sure the chest, you know, it's full of air. I need Sadiq. Everyone who say, I am righteous, is the biggest wicked. Everyone who say, everything I ever ask my rabbi, his answer is always already known in advance. Avonot garmo. The sins caused it. Ask him why this has happened. Always take responsibility. My sins, my sins, my sins. What sins? Not, a, not one sin a year. When you, uh, you know so much Torah, you already know there's a lot to improve. When you know zero Torah, you really think you are the chief rabbi of Israel. If you see what kind of ignorant writes comments, they don't even know how to read. Forget about to open a book. And they speak like the minimum the chief rabbi of Israel, contradicting his decisions. With such arrogance. Why? Did they ever learn something in their life? So when you don't learn, 
you look like a real tzaddik in your eyes. When you begin to learn, <laughs> after a month you will know how far you are from the truth and what's waiting for you in the next world. Now when you finally discover how horrible your lifestyle is and how many thousands of things need an in immediate improvement, there is a chance you'll succeed. Before you learn, there's no chance. To fix what? To fix something I do wrong and I don't even think it's wrong. I think it's actually great. The way people translate things without knowing Torah is usually the opposite of Hashem's intention. Usually. Huh? I will not forget, I will never forget this. One time I published on my Facebook, 10 years ago, a picture of an invitation. You're all welcome to the wedding on, of Meital and Mahmoud. Meital is Israeli girl from Rishon LeZion, getting married to Mahmoud, some Arab guy, and publishing a wedding invitation on Facebook. That thousands of people will see this Chilul Hashem. And I only wrote in my Facebook, people used to have shame for assimilation and losing their Jewish identity. Today nobody has a shame. And the lefties immediately reported me to Facebook and they shut my page for over a month. And it came back one day after Rosh Hashanah. And I knew Hashem shut it. Rosh Hashanah is a new decision. So, she is getting married to Mahmoud. And one woman sent me a comment. Rabbi, shame on you. I cannot believe it, on the Facebook comment. I would expect someone like you as a rabbi to be the first one that congratulate them. <laughs> Why this woman, this brilliant woman, wrote such a stupid comment? Maybe she's a professor, I don't know who she is. Maybe she's a teacher in school. Maybe she's a doctor, who knows what she is. I don't know who that woman is. One thing we know that her Judaism, her knowledge in Judaism is zero. Not one percent, zero. Zero, complete zero. She doesn't even know that it's a huge crime for a Jew to marry an Anjou. Not necessarily an Arab. Any Swedish, German, French, American. No difference. Hashem told us we're not allowed to marry any other nation. It's nothing to do with racism. I explained it many, many times. I don't want to repeat it. Once a person commits such a crime against Hashem and brag about it, publish an invitation with no shame, and expect people to come and congratulate him, him or her, do you know how many modern Orthodox people go to gay marriage? Did you know that or no? People with a leather yamaka or yamaka like Bennett, size of a quarter, they come to a gay wedding and cry. <laughs> what, what happened, Mr. Religious Guy? Oh, I'm so happy for them. For who? For Avi and Itzik. And then the Reform Rabbi, I, I'm a Cohen. I want to give you a bracha. Yevarechecha Hashem v'yishmerecha. This is a circus. It's not even a comedy. It's a bunch of people, brainless people. They are committing abomination, death sentence by stoning, an eternal cut for the soul, all written in the Torah, and the fool is giving them a blessing. Hashem will bless you and, reg and guard you. <laughs> what you just did will bring an eternal suffering to you, you fool. Zero knowledge. Zero knowledge. Ignorance. It's the worst cancer in life. The worst. No recovery from such a thing. You got to get rid of your ignorance. En amar, it's chasid. You want to stay in ignorant? When you see the consequences of this choice that you made to stay in ignorant in Torah, 
Then you will remember me, and you remember all the warnings that I gave you over the years. So everyone who ever hear it, and continue not to learn Torah. Continue not to play lectures in his car, and instead he plays the news and sport and all kinds of other nonsense. You already spend two, three hours a, a, a day in a train or in a car. Why don't you listen to a lecture a day? Two, three hours Torah. Why not? Do you know how much you're going to grow from that? To me, it's so clear. Sometimes uh, parents ask me, what should I do with my teenager daughter or son? I said, just one thing. Make them watch my film Torah and Science. Ah, they won't want, I don't want to be, it's too long. You know, excuses. Make sure they watch it. Don't you have something, a different idea? No, no, just this. That will change everything. No, but they're not, they, they can't. They, they pay the money. Tell them you don't have to watch in one shot. Watch an hour a day, four days in a row. An hour, an hour, half an hour, a whole week. Little by little. I don't care, ten minutes a day. Watch it. Little by little, pay the money. Tell them when you finish the, the film, I ask you a few questions. If I see you watch it to the end, I'll give you 200, 300, 500, everyone according to his pocket. You think that will solve the problem? Yes. So one person told me, I did what you said, and he actually watched it, and nothing has changed. You're wrong. A lot has changed. Yeah, you don't see any change yet, but you know what changed? The knowledge in his head. Until now, there was no God in his life. Religion looked like something very stupid. Religious people were primitive, ignorant, fools from a thousand years ago who doesn't want to become advanced. That's how he looked at that. According to him, liberalism, communism, Zionism, Every anti everything that is anti-Jewish is advanced, and everything religious is primitive, Iran. That's the way he was programmed in the public schools of Israel or America. According to him, there was no difference between being straight or gay. Well, anyone can do whatever they want. According to him, there was no life after death in his mind. There's no reward and punishment. Everything is random. Everything is nature. From now, everything is different. He knows there is a boss to the world. He knows the Torah is divine. It can never be written by human being. He knows he's going to get punished for everything he does. Just because he doesn't want to change because of his desires, or his ego, or he doesn't want to show you that you won, just give it a time. In two weeks from now, Hashem is going to get him into an accident. Boom! The whole car is on fire or something. A wake-up call. What do you think? He can run away from me? Another month went by. Boom! Another big problem. Lost big amount of money someone stole. Another issue. Someone offered him a date and last minute the girl canceled. One punch after the other. Hashem doesn't, does not do half a job. Once he watched it, the punches will begin. The punches are love patches of a father who wants to save his child from taking drugs and die, or to lose his internal happiness. So you get one smack, and then a bigger one, and then you lose money, and then you're sick, and then you sit in hospital for a few days. And in the end, Every time something happened to you, you remember the film. Because now, you cannot say, I don't believe. I'm an atheist. It doesn't matter what you say to the people. I, it does not impress me even a bit. He can swear on his mother's life that the movie did nothing. I know 100%. And once you watch this film, you know for sure there is a God, the Torah is divine, the oral Torah is divine, there is life after death, there is reward and punishment, and you also know the purpose of life. So if you rebel and you still don't want to accept it, you learn the hard way. What comes through, what does not come through the head, comes through the legs. 
the famous Israeli brilliant sentence that they invented in the army. Ma shelo ba derech harosh, ba derech haraglaim. Give me a similar sentence in English. Do you have any slang? What doesn't... <laughs> what doesn't come the easy way comes the hard way. What doesn't come the easy way comes the hard way. Okay, that could be that. Rabotai, now we understood what the Gemara means. Sometimes you learn it and you learn it and you wonder. First thing I have to check is Limut Torah. Why they say this and this and that? If you don't see any problem with the way you daven, if you don't see any problem with the way you make brachot, if you don't see any problem with the way you don't watch your eyes and look at the girls on the street, if you don't see anything wrong with your Lashon Ara every day, there's only one source to all of these problems. Ignorance and lack of learning Torah. If you learn Torah, all the problems will become a thousand times bigger in your eyes. And now you're going to be very careful. Why you don't touch it? I don't play with fire. I show a kid that 10 years did not want to hear about religion. From age 15 to 25, Torah and science. Finally agreed to watch after 10 years. He only agreed because he got the punch of his life in his business. 10 years of hard work went down the drain. So now he agreed to watch. Within a week, kept Shabbat, put back the yamaka, make brachot, make birkat amazon. And yesterday he asked me, can you get me a nice white talit? That feeling came out of the boy them. <laughs> Got rid of all the dust. I see marks. On his hand after Shachrit. Wow. A new, a new creature. What happened? Watch Torah and science. Torah and science with the combination of getting a few punches from Hashem, it's a wonderful winning combination. You can't, def you can't defeat it. Entering lots of knowledge in a film of four hours that it's actually like a year of learning concentrated into one film. Learning all the foundation and all the principles in one film. All the proofs you need. Understanding all the big dilemmas and questions you have every day against Hashem in your life. Why wicked people celebrate, why righteous people suffer. Why this and why that. If Hashem knows the future, how do I choose what I do? If I came to the world and Hashem knew how I'm going to die, how exactly I choose to be righteous or wicked. All these famous questions. Everything is answered one by one with sources in the Torah. It's a treasure. So if you still do not want to understand that you finally got the point, we will remind you. That was the one rabbi had argument with me, he said that when you present facts like this, if you prove, it takes away two choices from those. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Don't tell me who this rabbi is, please. I don't want to lose my admiration to him, whoever he is. But excuse my language, that's the dumbest thing I heard in 20 years. By proving a person that the Torah is divine, it takes away his free choice? Yes. Do you know how many people you show them on a screen when they smoke that it kills them and every cigarette shortens their life by 10 minutes? And what do they do after you finish the speech? Light a cigarette. How come it didn't take away their free choice to light a cigarette? How many people read in the Torah every day when they learn that you're not allowed to steal and every minute they steal in a cash register in a business? What happened to the free choice? How come it was not eliminated? How many people know this woman is forbidden to them and all they want is her? Why, they didn't hear the rabbi say 20 years about the end of a person that does such a thing? How many gays listen to lectures? Some of them send me even an emails anonymously telling me about their problem. And they watch it and watch it and watch it. And what do they do? Live with another gay in the house. Still not changing. So that's dumb. That's nonsense. 
and it's heresy also. One thing it's dumb, okay, a lot of people are dumb, but that's heresy. Do you know why it's heresy? Because the entire Torah is built on proofs. How many times Moshe said to the Jewish nation, Hashem proved to you, Hashem showed you, everyone who followed Baal Peor, Hashem wiped him out, Hashem showed you this, Hashem, Hashem testing you, Hashem tested Abraham. What all this? What all this? All proofs. Why did Hashem tell us about the fish and the stars and the renewal of the moon and the codes in the Torah? Why did Hashem plant codes in the Torah? That today we discover it with the help of the computer. Because he knew that in the end, the, the final generation will be all ignorant heretics, atheists. People with no dignity, no shame, no wisdom, no nothing. How are you going to prove to them the Torah is divine? You show them that the Torah already talked about the Holocaust in equal mathematical skip in the text. The idea is, was, is to teach Torah, teach Torah, teach Torah, but okay, okay, I, I said that could take a long time, and still a person who might not be convinced. So when you should... First of all, act, I tell you, I'm trying to give him the benefits of the doubt that maybe what he means is that if you put a person in yeshiva and he's going to learn and learn and learn, he won't need proofs. He will see the brilliance of the Torah, and he will know that it's from Hashem. Good luck with that. How many secular people you can put in yeshiva for one year to sit and learn Torah? Do you know how many people had to pay them money to come for one month to the yeshiva? Two, three thousand dollars, because I saw great potential in them. So I would come, but I owe two months rent. I owe to how much? Three thousand five hundred dollars. And I owe to my, my roommate five hundred dollars. So how much you need? Uh, 4,000? Yes, but I have other things. Credit card bill, this, that. In the end, 5,000. Okay, I'll make a deal with you. I'll pay all your bills. You sit one year in yeshiva. Can you sign on it? Would you do that? Yeah. It's worth it for me that you sit one year and learn Torah, and maybe one day you'll be a big rabbi. It's a great thing. For $5,000, it's worth any amount of money. Sometimes something huge will come out of it. Sometimes nothing will come out of it. After a year or two, he would leave the yeshiva. Tough. We only have an obligation to try our best. What comes out of it, not always is in our hand. Not always. Sometimes good things will come out of nowhere. Sometimes nothing will come out of a very significant move. In the end, nothing comes out. Believe me, some of the films I made, I didn't believe they're going to make so many ballet tshuva. Some of the fields, I knew they're going to make a lot of ballet tshuva, they made less than I thought. Why? Maybe it's the person who made the editing, maybe... You know, I want to tell you something. The film I made, Torah and Science, the first one, there is a person right here in Brooklyn. His name is Nisim Lazari. He is the owner of J. Root Radio. You know Jay Root Radio? Okay. He's a friend of mine, Sadiq, down-to-earth person. Back in time, he had the studio of Jay Root Radio, and he had another guy, Jacobs, Iran Jacobs. I was working for him at that time. Photographer, video guy, who filmed all kinds of events. They worked together in a radio station. I said to him that I have an idea. I want to film this whole seminar to make the film Torah and Science. With no hesitation, he told me, come to the studio. We'll do everything for you for free. It will cost hundreds of dollars an hour in studio, each hour. And then the editing will cost thousands of dollars. And, you know, it would, it would be $20,000 from beginning to the end. So I went to the studio because Nisim was 100% Lashem Shamayim. And Iran Jacobs won 100% Lashem Shamayim. They didn't want to get money or anything. They put all their art and their time into the mission. And I came 100% Lashem Shamayim, trying to make a film to make a lot of ballet tshuva. Three partners are all putting their hearts and good intention to save souls, purely, which is very rare, because today there's always a lot of politics. This was a, a unique situation. Three partners, pure heart, Pure mind, 100% only to save souls. After the film was made, and it was much harder to make a film 20 years ago than today. Today the software, 
It doesn't take even 5% time of what it took 20 years ago. You know how much work there was? After the film was made, I still needed the first batch to start giving CDs. It costs money, no? Okay, now you have the master DVD. But you need money to, to make the first shipment. Once you put two or three thousand on the street, they will bring more donations. So I was sitting in a yeshiva, Rav Bachrach, the Rosh Yeshiva in Monsi. The yeshiva is poor. The yeshiva is poor. The yeshiva barely pays the bill. You know, it's hard. Or Israel yeshiva in Monsi. More than 30 years of producing hundreds of Baalei Tshuva. Many of them are big rabbis in the world today. The yeshiva is struggling. I'm talking to you 20 years ago. Even today it's very tight. I told him, Baruch Hashem, I made this film. It's going to make tens of thousands of Baalei Tshuva guaranteed. His eyes opened up. I said, no, very good. I said, no, but we just need, I just need the first sponsor to the first shipping. Bezrat Hashem, I'll find someone this week. How much you need? I said, about $1,000 to start. I'm going to put out 1,000 DVDs. And Bezrat Hashem, that's going to start bringing donation. <laughs> On a spot, he wrote to me a check for $1,200. He said, here. This is yeshiva for Baalei Tshuva. If that's going to make Baalei Tshuva, and you'll be able to bring him to yeshiva, the yeshiva can pay for it. Five years later, I saw him in a wedding on the side. I said to him, you know, you gave your life to the yeshiva, you teach Torah. You directed so many people that came here, made them Bnei Torah. You made shiduchim. You give shiurim in the yeshiva. You did so much. But one thing I promise you, 30 years of, of work from morning to night that you did is not even 1% of that check that you wrote for Torah and Science that made more than 100,000 ballet tshuva that film. He almost fainted. I said to him, you will see in Olam Abba. 40, 50 years you're going to work in yeshiva, kill yourself like a slave. All day be psychologists or people that have crisis, they came from being secular, you put them in the right track, you help them, you ma it's full-time psychologist. You have to give them money, they go on dates, you have to get them whatever they need, holidays, find them place to eat, you know, it's not easy. All of that did not reach 1% of that check. Because that check made the opening of Torah and Science, they have it I think in nine languages. How many converts this film made? <laughs> I can count. Everywhere I go, Israel, here, I see this black guy, Chinese guy, Korean, all of them beard. I was just in Florida. There were maybe, I don't know, 200 people. 30 of them were converts. Beard, Yamaka, Kisui Rosh, family of five. Haredim! All from Torah and science. Right there in front of your eyes in one lecture. Everything goes also to the account of Nisim, Iran, the rabbi, and the people that sponsored the yeshiva. The money came out of the kupa of the yeshiva, went to me. And then all the people that continue to donate over the years, everybody eats from the cake. Eternal reward. Every bad tshuva would produce billions of mitzvot to you with his children and grandchildren. Meshalem la adam ke prima ala love. I don't pay according to what you did, to what came out of it. It continued to generate residual income. Like you buy a building. Every month you get rent forever. One time you bought a building, but 30 years later you continue to get rent, 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 and only go higher and higher. The rent of 30 years ago in Manhattan was. When I lived in Manhattan, I was probably 23, 24, yeah, 24. Two bedrooms in Upper East Side in a very fancy building was $1,300 rent. Today it's 6,000, that apartment. The building, I think it was 30 floors. The name of it is Normandy Court. 95th between 2nd and 3rd. Probably have a thousand apartments there. 
So people used to pay, let's say, 1300 in average apartment, now they pay four times more. The rent today is four times more. And also the building, 30 years ago when they built it, was probably 30 million, 40 million dollars. Now it's a billion dollar, a building like this, or 800 million. A building like this in Manhattan, Upper East Side, now how much it cost? Hundreds of millions. That's just one piece of real estate. Continue to generate profit, go higher and higher. One time you invested and it generates forever profit. This is only one piece of real estate. Do you know what it means to save a soul? Multiplied by a hundred trillion, just one person. And then it's, if it's 10, and if it's 100, and if it's 1,000, if it's 10,000. No matter how many times I repeated it over the years, there's going to be 20,000 people hearing this lecture in the next two or three weeks. Five of them will send donation from 20,000. Now you go and explain to me how can it be. You have schut for that. Let's say if you don't have a schut. You burn on restaurants thousands of dollars a month. There are people like this. Dedicate one dinner to that. You go to a restaurant here, kosher restaurant here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, forget Manhattan. Two people, five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. I don't want to say names. Very expensive. Steakhouse, five hundred dollars for two people. If you try to be cheap, four hundred. Just the tip they force you to give twenty-one percent. Yeah, if the bill is $400, you have to pay 80 something dollars to the waiter who serve you three, four plates. Nice Great income, makes more than a doctor. No jokes. A dentist makes less, less than a waiter in this kosher steakhouse. It serves about six or seven tables an hour. Each one of them, 60, 70, 80, 90, sometimes is a table of 12. That can be right there, two hundred dollars tip. Who knows how much they make? I was, I'm thinking to myself when I see the bill sometimes, how much they take from the from the dinner to the waiter. They force you. That's it. It became a law. Yeah, whatever you be, it's five hundred dollars. A hundred from that has to be a tip. So I'm thinking, if this waiter is barely twenty-two, twenty-three, have five, six tables like this an hour, he makes five hundred dollars like a lawyer. Why need, why you need to go to medical school or law school? Right away, age 20, you become a professional waiter and make fortune. You don't have to work so many hours. Six, seven hours and you're done. It's easy one. Huh? It's easy one because you serve. Easy, you don't need any talent. All you have to know is to hold the plate and not knock it down, which is also a talent. <laughs> Some people, even that, they cannot do. Smart. You know? But it is what it is, Rabotai. Any questions before we finish? We'll pray our way. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia Omer, Atzah Kedosh Baruch Hu Lezakot